I will only say that I do not know if human misery can be portrayed with more realism than to see so many people leaving in such confusion with the cries of women and children so burdened by obstacles and difficulties. And truth be told, if these people have sinned, then they are paying for it dearly. Don Juan de Austria, letter of 6 November 1570. Hi there. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. Now, what Ricotta tells Sancho Panza is one of Cervantes' most problematic passages. Given the social bonding on display, it's difficult to take the apologetic tone of Ricotta's description of the policy of expulsion seriously. First, he underscores the terror caused by the proclamation and edict which His Majesty ordered to be issued against those of my nation. But then, he endorses Felipe III's decision, using the same logic and metaphors that were used to justify the policy. It seems to me that it was divine inspiration that moved His Majesty to enact such a noble resolution. Not because all of us were guilty, for some were Christians true and firm, but because these were so few that they could not oppose those who were not. And it was not good to harbor the snake so near the heart, allowing the enemy inside the house. In the end, with just reason, we were punished with the penalty of exile, moderate and lenient in the opinion of some, but in ours the most terrible that could befall us. What is going on here? At the very least, Rigote invinces a Stockholm syndrome by sympathizing with the persecutors. Regarding Cervantes' intentions, the inherent goodness of Rigote trumps his own endorsement of the expulsion. It could be wrong, of course. It might be more accurate to say, that the irony and perspectivism of Cervantes' complex narrative disallows easy conclusions about these types of issues. And note again the timelessness of Cervantes' fiction. Look at Europe's Muslim immigration problem. History does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Even so, there are no easy answers. Things get more tragic and more complicated. Ricotta describes the agony of the Moriscos. Wherever we are, we cry for Spain because it is her natural homeland, and love for one's country is sweet. He then relates his journey through France and Italy on his way to Germany. In fact, Ricotta now lives in the very place after which the Habsburgs take their name. I took a house in a town near Augsburg. We read another hotly debated passage when Ricotta claims that in Germany, he's not persecuted for his religious beliefs. I reached Germany, and there it seemed to me that one could live with more liberty, because the inhabitants do not pry into the lives of others. Each lives as he wishes, because in most places one lives with freedom of religious conscience. Note how this idea anticipates the fundamental importance of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Did you know the promulgation of the decrees of expulsion of the Morisco population was celebrated on March 25, 1611, in Madrid with a parade attended by Philip IV dressed in white. More agony. We learn that Ricote has been separated from his wife and daughter, who are in Argel. And Sancho Panza faces one final social and economic predicament. Ricote claims his wife and daughter are Catholic Christians, and yet he admits that he himself is ambivalent. And even though I am not so committed, I am still more Christian than more. And I always pray to God that he open the eyes of my understanding and let me know how best to serve him. Remember this Neoplatonic take on theology. Rigote wants God to show him the light of how to be a proper Christian. The problem facing Sancho Panza is that Rigote proposes that his friend helps him recover buried treasure so that he can rescue his family from Algiers. If you want, Sancho, to come with me and help me dig it up and hide it, I will give you 200 schools, which means you can remedy your needs, and you know that I know that you have many. Note that, figuratively speaking, the ethical dilemma of the first part of Don Quixote, the issue of the 100 schools that Carrasco brought up in chapters three to four from the second part of Don Quixote, has now been doubled, and note how the theft of Cardenia's money by Sancho Panza now relates to the expropriation of the Moriscos by the Spanish crown, the Inquisition, and the local oligarchies and old Christians who supported the policy of expulsion. Quixotic Mission 
How much money does Ricote offer his good friend Sancho Panza if he will help him recover his treasure? A. 200 maravedis B. 200 reales C. 200 escudos Correct answer, C. 200 escudos Like Sancho the slaver in the first part of Don Quixote, Sancho the governor in the second part of Don Quixote disappoints modern readers. He refuses to help Ricote. Even if the Morisco were to pay him double and upfront and in cash, he says he will not betray his king, because it would seem to me treachery to my king to favor one of his enemies. I would not go with you, even if, as you just promised to give me 200 escudos, you were now to offer me 400 and in cash. Moreover, he claims that he's not greedy. I am in no way avaricious. Offering as proof the fact that he has not embezzled money from his time in office. Given Sancho Panza's constant interest in money, get-rich-quick schemes and salaries, do we believe him? At the end of chapter 54, Ricote asks about Sancho Panza's governorship, hilariously pointing out that there are no isles on terra firme. Sancho Panza insists that he has governed like a Sagittarius, allowing Shuren, the teacher of Achilles, again referring to the classical genre of princely advice manuals that are a major theme of the second part of Don Quixote. Ricotta tells Sancho Panza to drop his fantastical talks of governing islands and embrace the option of helping him recover his treasure. At this point, Sancho Panza says, Be content that I will not expose you, alluding to the fact that he risks six years in the galleys for helping a morisco. Finally, Ricotta asks if Sancho Panza has news of his family, and Sancho Panza reports that a certain Don Pedro Gregorio was courting Ricotta's daughter. Cervantes' favorite theme of lovers with different social statuses. Gregorio is not only an old Christian Spaniard, he's also the firstborn of a wealthy family. That rich young heir. Ricote expresses confidence that moriscas rarely, if ever, get mixed up in love with old Christians. And Sancho Panza sympathizes given the political circumstances. May God make it so, for it would go bad for both of them. Then Sancho Panza and Ricote hug once more and go their separate ways. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.